conversions, which we will talk about in depth later. Uh, office rents are stabilizing, although I would say effective rates are still lagging a little bit, particularly in the CBD. And then in terms of the investment market, Boston is one of the most liquid office markets that, uh, in the US, largely driven by life science activity, but definitely on, on radar for, for investment activity. And in the industrial market, I mean, we've just continued to see record breaking, low vacancies, record breaking rent growth. Um, you know, we're looking at sub 5% vacancies for all industrial across the entire market, our class A distribution inventory, we're looking at sub 3% uh, in terms of vacancy. You know, big leases are dominating. Um, recent activity, you have Trimark, uh, the Postal Service, UPS, all executing large leases in the third quarter. Um, you know, we have asking rents upwards of $12 a square foot, and we're continuing to hear of new and higher proposals that are coming out for um, what space is left available. And, you know, again, current market conditions are really driving liquidity here, even in a more tertiary logistics market like Boston, we're seeing a lot of uh, investment in the industrial market. That's excellent. Thank you, Liz, so much. And that's a perfect segue. David, although your team is not new to Boston, FHR Capital itself is a new platform. Can you tell us a little bit about why you're still committed so, so much to Boston and, and what you see? Yeah. Absolutely. So I, I think I think Liz nailed it. I mean, look, there's a ton of capital chasing uh, industrial assets right now, which makes my job pretty hard. Um, but so our investors, if backing up 40,000 feet, our investors, and, and frankly, any investor in today's environment has fixed income exposure and is dealing with really low returns. And so for some of the best credit, you know, think the AAA bonds, that's a sub 1% yield that's taxable. Um, so given our backgrounds and we kind of put our heads together, uh, sold, bought, managed a lot of industrial real estate, we identified a core industrial real estate strategy as something that could replace or really be an alternative to that fixed income exposure. Um, so we've established a, a fund and our platform is to go acquire the very best located, long-term lease to credit, really high state-of-the-art uh, industrial facilities uh, in the major metros around the country. You mentioned Boston is one of our target markets. With interest rates and cap rates where they are today, we can provide or project four to five percent cash on cash that grows annually to an investor that's getting sub 1% on a taxable basis, this, and in our view, is an attractive risk-adjusted return um, because the real estate distributions are tax advantage. So it's really a, a seven to 8% with minimal or, or possibly even less credit risk on it. So if you have a 10 year lease to Amazon and they stop paying their rent, um, we have a bigger problem in the world than, than just the, the industrial building. So we view it as a very safe sleep at night, cut your coupon, uh, solution to the to the low yielding bond world uh, that we're in right now. So we're our our platform is focused entirely on that. We love Boston, which I'm happy to get into more. Um, but uh, and we've done about 200 million dollars in the last 18 months of acquisitions, and uh, and have performed on those four to five percent cash returns. That's excellent. Thank you so much. Do you want to go just a little further? Excuse me, into the supply demand balance. Maybe talk a little bit more about um, that uh, equation. Absolutely. So right now there's a, a, a massive supply demand imbalance and it's actually getting worse as these, uh, everyone's reading about it in the journal, these supply chain hiccups that are causing us to go pay $6 for a loaf of bread in the grocery store. Um, but sort of to, to put it in context, last year, all retail sales were about $600 billion of all retail, uh, I'm sorry, all e-commerce sales accounted for $600 billion of all retail sales. That's about 15% of the retail economy. Most of the, the you know, CBRE, JLL, all the experts in the, and, and Liz in the Newmark Research Department project that that number is gonna go up to about 40% of all retail sales by 2025, which is gonna be about a, a trillion and a half dollars. You're gonna need more industrial real estate space to house these goods. Um, so most estimates, we took the down the middle uh, number, which is about a billion square feet of class A e-commerce space. Um, our current system, so, so by 2025, we need a billion square feet. That's 200 million square feet a year. 
on conservative numbers. Our current system typically supplies between 100 and 150 million square feet of this brand new class A stuff per year. So you don't need to be a mathematician to understand that's about a 50 to 75 million square foot deficit on a yearly basis. So there's this massive, there's this massive supply demand imbalance um, that it, at this point, supply can't keep up with demand. We're seeing rent growth go through the roof. Um, and, and just a live data point. So Boston's one of the markets I cover, obviously. 40% of all the construction that's happening right now, so for class A, core industrial, that's built on spec, is 40% of it is pre-leased to a tenant prior to the building even being constructed. So six, seven years ago, that, that most of this stuff would sit vacant for 12, 18 months, and then you go lease it up to someone. Before the building is given a certificate of occupancy, a tenant is approaching a landlord and say, hey, we got to have this space. We don't really care about the price, but we got to have it. Um, and in Boston, where you have you know, a lot of rooftops, a lot of job growth, and a lot of barriers to entry. Um, people are getting crazy, especially retailers are getting crazy with where they, where they take down leases. And um, I think that's indicative of 40% of the product being pre-leased to construction. Unbelievable. So David, just to take that one step further then, um, since the start of the pandemic, then the industrial asset class has fared, I mean, you're, you're telling us how successful it's been, right, in these target markets and specifically Boston, and maybe tell us a little bit about how it's changed, especially related to construction costs and availability of land. Right. So it, uh, you hit the nail on the head. The, the industrial asset class, I don't think there's been a better asset class that's performed better over the last 18 months, for, for better or for worse. Um, and, you know, I think that's a, a product of, I'll give you an example. My parents never bought stuff online, on Amazon, anything like that. COVID required them to lock down. And, um, you know, they, they bought everything on Amazon. Now, when I go home, they, they've realized how easy it is to go on your phone. Okay, I need, you know, a box, of whatever it is, anything, you know, pencils, paper. The, uh, now, when I go home, I see a package you know, a, a stack of packages from Amazon in the front door. It's, it's, it's kind of funny. But so this, this imbalance, um, to take it a step further, Elizabeth, has created really low vacancy rates. As Liz touched on, I think it's sub 5%, which in Boston is just, we haven't seen that in a long time. Um, you know, when I first started covering Atlanta, it was a 10, 12, 13% market vacancy. They just went below 7%. Um, and Atlanta's huge. Dallas, Fort Worth, same story. There's nothing but land the further north you go. Um, they're in the same sort of vacancy rate. I mean, people are just gobbling up space. Um, so it's created a low vacancy environment. It's created a really low returning asset class because everyone wants it. Low capital costs because you have brand new buildings and a tenant paying rent for the next 10 years. You kind of just sit there. And it, fortunately for me, it's pretty easy. Um, and it's a safe equity environment. So we're taking advantage of that by saying, hey, guys, look, you can go get your 1% in municipal bonds, or you could go get 4, 5, 6, maybe even 7% uh, buying a 10-year leased asset to Amazon, where there's really nothing to do for the next 10 years, 10 years but collect a rent check. And, and the, and the underlying growth rates, as we've seen, um, continue, to, continue to go up because of this supply-demand imbalance. Excellent. Thank you. So Liz, if you don't mind, can we pivot to you because we're here to talk about office and industrial and I'd love for you to cover, you have a special focus on the life sciences sector. So perhaps you could talk a little bit about the conversion of office space for life science and other trends that you're seeing. Sure, sure. And I think this really ties into what David was talking about in industrial too. You know, in, in our market, it's, it's very hard to build. There are those barriers to entry. Uh, we are very, very dense. So we're starting to see a lot of what might be considered functionally obsolete, older, outdated suburban office inventory um, being converted to either life science, GMP, biomanufacturing. And now we're even starting to see some of these office buildings, particularly in the 495 belt, um, converted to distribution space because there really is a lack of land to build that product type as well. Um, 
but specifically office to lab conversions. That's something I spend nearly every day now um, looking at, working on, answering questions about. In the third quarter alone, we saw over a million square feet of office product come out of our inventory and move over to under renovation as lab or GMP space. And that's just this one quarter. We're tracking an additional um, 8.99 million square feet of other conversion projects that are either underway, moving forward, or in the planning pipeline. Most of that is delivering over the next few years. Um, speed to occupancy is very, very important right now amongst life science companies. There's very little existing space, um, particularly in Cambridge still, that's been chronically undersupplied for lab space. Um, but where we're seeing most of this conversion activity is really Seaport South Boston, which has emerged as, you know, a, a new flourishing life science hub. And the 128 West sort of Waltham, Lexington, Watertown, Bedford area. So ultimately, you know, this trend could help quicken the recovery in the office market if we start to see vacant space coming out of the inventory at a faster rate. Um, you know, so it ultimately could be positive for office fundamentals. Excellent. I love that positive outlook. Thank you. That's fantastic. Ryan, can you tell us a little bit about capital markets, what you're seeing, how lenders are viewing both office and industrial real estate in today's market? Sure. Um, so first off, there's, uh, you know, uh, capital is readily available from all the sources we deal with, both life insurance companies, and then in particular in this region of the country, the banks are extremely active. Um, you know, office has sort of been um, the big question mark um, for most lenders. It's um, trying to determine um, what the new, uh, you know, normal is going to be for um, work from home combined with how many people are going to be taking occupancy. Um, so with that comes, you know, adding additional TILC, really looking at the, the role and exit tenants, who's within these buildings and, you know, what, what's going to be the future of office. Um, you know, I think there's some kind of happy medium. I don't think it's certainly going to be a hundred percent work from home. I'm back in the office. Most of us are back in the office. Um, but, you know, if I, as I look around downtown, there's still quite a few buildings um, in our building in particular, um, which is just across from South Station, is probably at, you know, up to 20, 25% occupancy on a daily basis. So, um, you know, I think people still are going to need space, in particular, new employees. Um, it's been very hard for us across all of our offices to train new employees. Um, it's, it's very difficult to get recent college grads or, you know, people who are unfamiliar with the position to, to sort of learn when they're not hands-on and to jump into meetings, et cetera. Um, we're, a, you know, we're a, a belly to belly business and commercial real estate. So we're, you know, we need to meet with our capital sources. We need to meet with our lenders. They come into town. We need to show them around. So it's, there's certain industries that I think office is going to need to have, but I think there's going to be some combination of, you know, what, what the future space need is in particular for some of these larger tenants that are, you know, go, coming out and saying that, you know, they're going hundred percent work from home. So um, I'll leave that, that to the, the leasing folks and the people a lot smarter than me, but that, that's sort of the, the view from a, from a capital perspective and our, um, you know, all of our lenders are certainly being a little bit more conservative on the office underwriting, albeit, um, you know, interest rates are at all time lows. Um, you know, you can get very long fixed rate money from both life insurance companies and banks, um, not just on swaps with banks, but on their balance sheet as well. Um, so, you know, it's, it's out there to do, I'd say they're being a little bit more conservative than what we're seeing in the industrial space. Um, and to, um, just transition to industrial, um, it's just been the, the asset class of choice, um, over the last, not just 18 months, but probably four or five years. Um, the pandemic really, you know, shined a light on, on how, how big of a shortfall there is, especially in what was historically an end note of Boston. Um, you know, this market hadn't been, you know, a big, big industrial supply market. Um, and, and then the, uh, as Liz alluded to, a lot of these spaces are being transitioned. We have clients that are trying to buy any swath of developable land anywhere near 495, just because there's such a shortfall and, you know, with sub 5% vacancies, you can't, you can't meet that demand. And, um, obviously there's the development hurdles that we see from a number of our clients and it might take 12 months to get into the ground and start coming out with steel on some of these sites. So, um, you know, an, an industrial user that's a hundred plus thousand square feet they they don't want to say, Hey, you know, we can have you a building in 12 months. They want to be able to sign a lease and move in, you know, next week. So, 
Um, we're seeing a lot of spec construction. Um, where that is in capital markets and what we're seeing is, you know, the debt funds are extremely active. Um, we're able to find, you know, sources of capital up, upwards of 85, 90% on a spec basis for these construction deals and everything that we've done. Um, as soon as the steel starts going up, they've had extreme interest from not only, you know, tenants, but, but credit tenants willing to take huge blocks of space. And sometimes tenants like, like the Amazons of the world that have a building, you know, five minutes down the street, but they just know that they're going to, they're going to need that space down the road. So, um, and then, you know, with the existing product, what we've seen and in, in, in the demand is that, um, you know, th there's, there's a lack of new construction going on and the new construction costs because of the slot supply chain interruptions and material cost increases. Um, you know, the, 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 the existing product has, has just grown on a, on a rent basis. Um, and, you know, we're seeing huge value creation just for the fact that, you know, new construction products are seeing rents in the low teens to, to mid teens just to get a, you know, a new industrial product because of land costs, material costs, labor costs. Um, so, you know, on a, if you can find any kind of vacant building or office conversion, all those numbers start making a lot more sense. Now, when you look at the metrics of what you can start charging rents, so you're seeing, you know, rents that used to be in the four and fives now on an existing building with, you know, you can go in and put some new LED lighting, um, exterior paint and, you know, clean, clean up the building a little bit. And they're getting, you know, close to, to nine bucks, triple net in these markets around 495. So. Um, all of our lenders that we deal with look for exposure in, 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 that, in the industrial market in particular in this region because they have little of it um, because of the limited supply. And, you know, I think that going forward, it's just going to continue to be a hugely successful asset class. And, um, you know, all those, uh, all those parcels that got utilized as higher and better uses 10 years ago for big mixed use developments. I'm sure there's some people that had wished they had uh, waited a little bit longer because, uh, you know, industrial metrics are only going to continue to improve. So that's excellent, Ryan. You you covered all the questions I wanted to ask about the heavy uh, demand for industrial space and the limited existing supply of buildings. So that's excellent. Thank you. And it's great to know that there's so many financing products available for new construction. It's just a matter of being patient for those twelve month construction. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just to give people indication, life companies still are best pricing. Um, we're still in the, the mid to high twos. If you're willing to take a little bit less from leverage, they're a little bit more conservative. Um, that pricing is typically at a 150 debt service coverage ratio based on a 25 year AM schedule. Um, and then, you know, banks are extremely aggressive too and have a little bit more flexibility for prepay. But, um, you know, across the board, again, it's the debt is just hugely favorable. So we've seen a huge, uh, you know, surge in, in demand for looking to either refi and then, you know, Dave's out there fighting the good fight on the, on the acquisition front. Um, fortunately for us, most of our clients approach us once they have a site tied up or a, or a property that's under PNS. So we, we get to just deal with the ones that are going, but it's, uh, it's certainly a street fight out there to try and win good asset classes. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's absolutely, uh, you know, a good market for, for debt and equity. And, you know, we're having a good year across the board for all of our, all of our offices, but finding, uh, the acquisitions is, is always a little bit tougher. So can feel for them there. I appreciate it. Ryan, I want to touch on something you, uh, you mentioned earlier, the, uh, the discussion of steel, I mean, steel has gone up like a hundred, 125% over the last 12 months. And, uh, you mentioned that developers are a having a hard time finding land. B, once they have the land tied up, you know, it's a question of how much is this deal going to cost, labor, all these things. We're, we're seeing that as well. And, and, you know, so here's just an, an anecdote. We're looking at a deal in St. Louis right now with a developer, and they've got the land site tied up, and they have a tenant in tow, and it's a good tenant. It's a Seattle-based e-commerce company, and um, they, uh, they can't get steel. It's not a matter of if they can buy it. They can't get it. So, I mean, these supply chain hiccups are, are, I mean, for the buildings that exist, the rent growth, we're seeing things we've, I mean, 11% last year in Boston for class A product. They was working on a deal in, in um, Bellingham and rents have moved literally 12% since this time last year. So it's just, it's, it's unprecedented, frankly. Yeah, no, I mean, hearing the same thing from all of our clients too. And, you know, we just, uh, I financed the, you know, spec construction of a 375,000 square foot warehouse building and distribution center. And, you know, they, they locked in their steel contracts and, you know, that was what delayed. They were supposed to have CO um, for, you know, they came out of the ground and were um, had a tenant within three months and a credit rated tenant for a long-term lease. 
Um, but the delay was exactly that was they, you know, they had locked in a steel order and, and it got pushed back for, for their site delivery. And, you know, in the pro forma, fortunately, they created so much value just because it took so long to get the land and site permitted. And, um, you know, they outperformed on the, the rental rates at the site, but um, the steel cost was a huge thing. It was, uh, and there were, you know, a couple months, I'd say probably, you know, last year where it was even higher. It was probably like, a, you know, 150% of where it used to be. So it's fortunately come down a little bit, but exactly that it's just, stuff to get that delivered on site. And, um, you know, I, think, I guess we need some more warehouse buildings, which is sort of that what came first, chicken or the egg, to start start housing some of the steel that, um, you know, is, can be produced. But there's just, I think that's where there's the the shortfall is is in the, the lack of production of steel. It's not just the fact that it's, you know, out there waiting on a on a ship trying to come ashore. I think there's a, right. certainly, a, you know, issues that, that kind of came about through the pandemic and jobs. And, um, you know, there's just a shortfall across the board. So, yeah. And it's impossible to get land. Zone. I mean, going back to the land thing, you know, people don't want, you know, 250 tractor trailers coming through their backyard every day. Um, this site in Bellingham that, that I worked on, it's, uh, it took them about a year and a half to get everything approved with the town of Bellingham. And, and frankly, I don't, I don't blame the, the local residents. I mean, it, you, don't want, you don't want that. Um, so they had to build special sound barriers. And so it's very prohibitive. The stuff that's on the ground right now that's built is only going to get better in dense markets like Boston. Um, and, and that's why it's one of our target markets. Yeah, it's amazing uh, the amount of neighbors that show up and want to protect some kind of cricket population or something when the <laughs> building's going up. But uh, it, can, it can be difficult, but I, it's, you know, it, it's, it's definitely needed. And, you know, no one wants it in their backyard. And there are, you know, solutions to designing these buildings that can, can make it, you know, doable and bring job creation and, you know, lower the tax rolls in some of these towns that haven't had a lot of industry. So I think it's, uh, right. it's important, but, you know, I can, I can see their gripe with that, so. Totally agree. Sorry, Elizabeth, we went off on oh, a no. um, Funny enough, David, I'm actually on the planning board um, in Bellingham, so I do live there. I did not work on that project that you were there on, um, but we are facing another development in town uh, that has received a lot of pushback from residents. And, you know, I'm hearing similar stories in other markets in the country, like northern New Jersey, where the residents are coming out and really... Uh, you know, opposing these developments. So it's making um, my job on the planning board very difficult uh, <laughs> as well. But yeah, I can I can see where, where all that's coming from. Totally. Interesting though, in, in other parts of the country, like in the Rust Belt, where you've got old industrial facilities that have been abandoned and there are, there are development organizations that are out there that we're working with specifically around Pittsburgh and, and beyond where you've got large old steel mills and things that are, and they're actually doing retrofits to those facilities, um, <clears throat> which does multiple things because we, um, we're going to talk about carbon here in a minute, but I'll just go to interject. When you, when you retrofit an old building, you capture the embedded carbon. You're not, you're not throwing new steel up, so you're not introducing new carbon. So when you get the measure of the old building and you get the, the, the measure of the total carbon footprint for the old building in the retrofit, it only adds to the positive sustainability that you're talking about for the future. So I, it's just something to, something to think about. And the retrofits, I'm a you know, we work in the retrofit world and we, we try to help people figure out the best and most economical way to get that older building operating efficiently and then being able to run it efficiently in order, in order to, you know, to, to, to run it in, in a way that's, that's good for the future. So anyways, with the, the old retrofits of these old industrial facilities, it, it's just, uh, it's really exciting. It's also really exciting when you see, um, see things. I, I worked on a, uh, did, did some work on a, an old prison down in Atlanta. David, you were talking about Atlanta. And it's the old prison down off of uh, 285, um, sure. or actually 85, um, looked like a castle. And uh, huge retrofit, absolutely beautiful facility when they were finished with it. But, you know, being able to see that, you know, not something new coming out of the ground, but being able to take the, the old product and, and, uh, and update it and have it run efficiently was really, is a really exciting uh, proposition. So Daly, this is a great opportunity to pivot, right? Tell, tell us more. We, we have so many questions, right? So we know energy costs have been rising rapidly over the last 20 years. You know, now we're moving into the pandemic recovery. So what do you see for the current fluctuation in energy markets? 
let's hit energy markets first. Energy markets, uh, the, the 20, their 15 year trend, the line is actually down. Energy is projected to decrease over the past, the cost decrease over the past 15 years. Um, and that line was consistently going down. And with the uh, industrial renewables being introduced into the market and there being opportunity for green energy in a, you know, the quote unquote green energy economy um, that, you know, that, that people talk about. Then COVID happened and the bottom fell out of it and everyone stopped using energy on an industrial and, and you know, office and every, you know, hotels, everything stopped, right? So we got this huge dip and the cost of energy in June of 2020 was a 20 year low. I mean, we saw it incredibly cheap. So what did that do? The oil, uh, gas, gas rigs count went down, storage went down, all these things happened. And guess what? We come out of the pandemic. We were slow to see the, see the future. And now all of a sudden, the cost, the, the, the demand is up and the demand is up in Europe. And so the gas market, which is indicative, the natural gas market, which is indicative of the electrical market and all, drives all of the markets, there is a bigger draw of export of natural gas in the United States to Europe because they're paying more for it. So with the lower number of rigs that are producing, the lack of storage and everything, you've got, you, we're actually exporting more gas than we're keeping. So the cost of natural gas is increasing and that causes the cost of, of because natural gas is the foundation for electricity that causes electricity to increase. So now we're seeing in the past months, this in September, in October, a 20 year high. So the, the gas market, I mean, the, the market just went crazy. So with that said, we as an energy consultancy working with, you know, everybody across the board in, in, the, in the commercial real estate, managing your risk is the real key. We, we go in, whether, whether you're trying to buy energy today for the next three years, or whether you're on a contract that's, you know, the extending out, there are strategies that need to be put in your forecast of how you're going to manage your asset and how you're going to manage your energy purchase. Everybody has to purchase energy. Unless you're one of these big warehouses that has decided to put a large solar, you know, so, solar field on their, on their or solar array on their roof, and they've got batteries and, you know, everything to do that, you still have to purchase energy no matter what. So, we work to try to protect people against these wild fluctuations in the market and, and try to make sure that that doesn't happen. So that's, that's key for operations. Um, the other thing that you asked about was, you know, the, the out, you know, what's the outlook on, on energy is energy is going to continue to decrease even after this bump that we're seeing and things start to normalize still the projections out for the next three years are showing a, 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 on that 15 year, the, it's not as steep as it used to be on the 15 year line, but it's, it is, it is there. So energy is, is something that, that we, we need to be aware of. And then the next phase is the amount of green energy that's going to be available. When you've got, there are massive um, renewable energy projects that are going on uh, south of south of uh, Rhode Island, out on the continental shelf. There's a giant uh, wind farm that's going in 30 miles off of Virginia Beach. There's another massive wind farm going in. There's giant solar arrays that are going in New Mexico and out, out west. So we're starting to see the industrial level green green assets become available to be purchased more in the market and be able to be available. Um, Massachusetts specifically is a very, uh, very ripe market for green, for, for being able to put green energy in, in any, if you have the avail availability to put in the solar array, it can pay for itself. And we see that over and over. Um, and it's, it's a, there, it is a good market. And you would think, you know, northern, uh, you know, nor northern part of the hemisphere that, that it wouldn't be that way. But due to some of the rebates and other things that are available and the, and the cost of energy, uh, it, it does pay for itself. So I'll stop there and let you ask your next question because I don't want to dominate just about energy. Well, well, it is about energy, actually. That dovetails exactly um, into my next question, where just last week, the city of Boston passed a very ambitious zero emissions ordinance for large yeah. buildings by 2050. Um, for those in the audience, it's the Building Energy Reporting and Disclosure, or BIRDO 2.0, um, yep. if you want to look that up. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how to plan for that? 
Yeah, I, I can, but let's let's first let's let's get two definitions done. They're, they're carbon neutral and net zero. So carbon neutral is the idea that you don't increase what you're currently doing, and you offset. You 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 may purchase offsets. You you offset for the carbon that you're that you're using. So let's say that I am a I am a building in downtown Boston, and I'm burning. Uh, you know, na- I'm buying natural gas produced uh, electricity. I, mean, I don't have any. You know, and it's not very, it's not running very efficiently. I just say, I'm going to keep running like I'm doing. And then I'm just going to buy offsets, carbon wrecks from somewhere to offset myself for my operation. Then I become carbon neutral. It's a cost initiative, right? Now, what the Bairdo 2.0 talked about was net zero. And that by 2030, the, the, to mitigate to a level where you are net zero, 50%, and then by 2050, you're 100% net zero. So what net zero means is that I'm going to take and I'm going to try to get my, I'm going to run as efficiently as possible. I'm going to upgrade my chillers. I'm going to upgrade my boilers. I'm going to do all LED lighting. I'm going to have controls on everything that I can and the, the good thing about that and the initial phase of that, that efficiency operation, it pays for itself and it financially pays for it. The low hanging fruit, we see ROI on the low hanging fruit of LED lighting, variable speed drives, upgrading up the upgrades, not the massive stuff, the upgrades can pay for itself within five years, which sometimes is challenging in the CRE world because I talk to a, you know, an owner and I say, hey, let's upgrade your stuff. And he's like, ah. Anything less than three years, I don't want to hear about it. Or more than three years, I don't want to hear about it because I'm, I don't plan on owning this building in three years. So you have to try to get through that mentality that when we decrease OPEX, increase increase NOI, we increase asset value, we can make more money on that building when we go to sell it. So we may want to start looking at things that are longer. And so the going in and doing the audit process and making the building run more efficient is the first step. So that, that's in carbon, new, carbon net zero, I'm doing that as the first step. Then I'm looking at the deeper cut, my chillers, my boilers, my, you know, all of the operations that are within the building. And those things may have, in some cases, may have 20, 30 year payback. But this is where the creative financing comes into play, where you can do CPACE financing or our green loan refinancing or things that that are available in the market that allow you to take the efficiency, roll it in and put it on on the asset financing and actually pay for it. And we see that that folks go through a, you know, a green loan and they'll come up with a checklist of things that need to get done. And then they come to us and we go in and help them as they're refinancing, go through and upgrade the property. And then if I'm working with a a very large hotel in a a historic building in Philadelphia, where they have a a $5 million chiller project that they're trying to do. And we're looking at CPACE financing for that. And CPACE financing is where it actually puts the financing and you get the money 100% and you put it on the property bill. And it goes with the asset. So when you sell it, it may be that you're paying for it on the on the um, property tax bill on a monthly basis and or on, on a yearly basis, however, however it's paid. You're, it's actually attached to the asset. So there's all kinds of creative vehicles here that allow allow you to take an existing asset and start to drive down the efficiency. Now, when we get past this point, and I, Boston is not different from any other city. You've got the Climate Mobilization Act in New York City, which um, people call it's LL97 is the driver for the buildings. You've got the Philly tuna. You've got Seattle, Boston, um, you name the major cities across the United States, they're all starting to adopt these programs where that first cut on your energy efficiency to get you to your efficient point is somewhere with current technology you know, you, you kind of get to diminishing return, right? You can't, you can only do so much because you still have to run the chiller to make the building work. But when you get past that, there's two, there's two schools of thought. There's going to be technology in the future that's going to allow us, things are going to come on between now and 2050. They're going to allow us to take it deeper, which is, is true. And then there's also offsets and green energy that comes in so that I can start to buy green energy on the grid. I can start to 
you know, maybe solar panels or local solar panels, maybe community solar to, to allow me to start to get, gain green energy in my portfolio that allows me to take it deeper to reach these this 50 percent net zero by 2030 and then 100 percent net zero by 2050 as we talked about so we started that conversation on carbon neutral i just neutralized what i'm currently doing net zero is that where i'm gonna take it down deep as i can through through my increasing efficiency in my operations and then i'll offset the rest through other through other other capabilities by that i that i can't get to net zero so I hope I answered your question. Very much you can so. I'm a little passionate about it. I, I like what I do. I like the passion. Um, so maybe we could just spend one more minute talking about the buzzword of today, ESG, okay. environmental, ah. social, and governance. All right. So I, I'll, I'll give you my... I'll give you my, I had a, I presented to an industrial company, a, a, a magnesium smelter yesterday on ESG, and I, I said... My opinion of the way we've attached ESG in the past is we hire a big consulting firm and they create a document that's like this. And it says, we want to do all these things and they plop it down on the CEO's desk and it's spread out to the board of directors and everybody goes, yeah, let's decrease this. Let's do that. Let's integrate our workforce. Let's do all these things because I need to do E stuff. I need to do S stuff and I need to do G stuff and all these things cover it. And that sounds great. And then we go down to the guys that are actually running the magnesium plants where they're this current client, there's nine of them across the, across the nation and in Canada and, and in England. And the guys that run the plants, they look at this and they go, how am I going to get here? So we, our, our organization, we're taking a more pragmatic approach where we're saying, let's measure, generally when you start with ESG, you start with what's called materiality. You define what has an impact to the business on this side of the graph and what has an impact to my stakeholders on this side of the graph, right? And those two things rise up and to the right. Those are the things that are, that are meaningful for me and they have material impact, right? We are taking the, the approach to say, let's take those material things and let's do one more thing to them. Let's find out what's impactful and then what's in achievable. And so we've started this word called achieviality, which is the contrary. It's not a real word. It's just what we say. It was the contrary from materiality, but it's what's achievable. And let's be more pragmatic about it because rather than just having this big document where the CEO says, yeah, I've signed up for 20% reduction in carbon. Okay, great. Let's talk to the guy at the plant. See if he can do that uh, with, with the current assets and the current money he has, right? Because there, there has to be, there has, it has to trickle all the way down. So what's achievable? And then the next thing is, if I'm running my building, let's say I've got an asset in Boston, and I increase air quality, by doing so, I decrease energy. So I, I increase air quality, and I'm getting, I have an energy conservation as well, where, it, you know, I've, I've decreased my carbon footprint. Guess what? I have a social impact for everyone that comes in the building. There, there's, there's a better environment for them. And in addition to that, I have a better governance. So well, guess what? By increasing air quality, I didn't just increase sustainability based on E, I increased S and G. So let's map across everything we do to try to figure out how the E impacts, in fact, S and G, let's figure out how G impacts and not just pull these things out of the air that say, yeah, this is great. I'm gonna go do this and make it a top-down approach. So for us, and we've started talking about this with many people across many different industries and everyone's like, my God, where were you five years ago? And I was like, well, I just thought of this last week and, and not really, but we've been building this. So it's causing us to take a completely different approach around ESG than what is the norm. And it's really a bit disruptive, but it's allowing since we spend most of our time at the plant floor level or at the, you know, in the boiler room with the guy, right? We're able to start to really make impacts around ESG from the bottom up. And hopefully we can start to meet that ESG report in the middle and have a, have a much more pragmatic approach about how we, how we address that. So ESG, environmental social governance, the three things, the buzzword, 
everybody's got to have a plan, but the plan has to be attainable, achievable, and have impact across the organization. So I, I hope I explained <laughs> that in a way you, you wanted to hear, excuse me. <laughs> Thank you, Daly. I feel like we could do an entire hour on that. So we'll probably have to come back to that. <laughs> yeah, time. we probably could. So I apologize for taking so long. <laughs> so um, our time is going so quickly and I want to leave a little room for Q&A at the end, but I thought it might be helpful just to wrap up if we could talk about, you know, if you're seeing any specific, you know, changes due as a result of COVID. Um, David, I think you touched a little bit on, you know, building design changes or operational changes. Um, how we're adapting to safe working conditions. If you wanted to maybe share a little bit on that before we run out of time, that'd be great. Sure. So, I mean, look, it's it's no surprise. It, the layout of offices prior to COVID is not really, you're not comparing apples to apples in an industrial building. Most of the stuff that at least we look at is 36 to 40 foot clear height. So high ceilings, not very densely populated uh, work areas. You know, they're 500,000 square foot warehouses. Um, but so we bought uh, three deals through COVID. And when I would go toward the assets, uh, look, they're not changing the building structure or anything like that. I know offices are, I'm not expert in that, but um, health screenings on the way in, a lot of hand sanitizer things around. They're making them wear masks. I, although, in the Sun Belt, where we do a lot of our work, they're they're uh, less inclined to do so. Um, and um, but in terms of in terms of building changes, there hasn't been much in the way of um, you know they they have uh, better air circulation. So excuse my language, but big ass fans is a huge thing in the industrial world for air circulation. You don't want to work in a warehouse in Atlanta in August and not have some sort of air circulation. So it's sort of a positive that they already had these, but they, some, we're seeing some owners um, increasing their ability to ventilate the air. Um, but but really the biggest change to COVID in the industrial space has been demand from users. Um, so I, if I had to pinpoint the biggest change, it's not really a design change. It's more of a uh, increased supply and increased, I'm sorry, increased demand change and unfortunately decreasing supply or limited supply. Thank you so, so much. Um, and perhaps we could talk just a little bit. Um, Liz, could you share with us what you're forecasting? What are we, what should we expect in 2022? Uh, yeah, I can give you a few of uh, my predictions for 2022, although who knows if they'll turn out as I expect, uh, considering the current conditions, things can change very, very quickly. But I think we'll continue to see office moving more towards this, this normalcy or stability, if you wanna call it that, return to office. Um, I think January is another big deadline that a lot of companies have um, put out there as a return to the office. So we may see that bump in usage um, in January. We've been waiting for that, I think, since Labor Day of 2020 at this point. So, um, you know, remains to be seen, but I think that that January deadline will be very, very interesting to watch in terms of how many people are actually coming back to the office. I think the recovery will continue to be uneven. You know, COVID variants, the Delta variant, challenges related to the pandemic, supply chain issues, inflationary conditions. I think there'll be a lot of unevenness as we move through, um, you know, this, this rebound um, in the marketplace. Uh, I think we'll continue to see some right sizing from traditional office users, uh, you know, finance, legal, M&A um, activity has been impacting that. I don't think that's COVID related necessarily. The, that trend was happening pre-COVID, but we're continuing to see that. And then, I mean, for industrial and life science, I think their growth trajectory will continue on despite how hot that those those sectors are. I think that just continues into 2022. Excellent, thank you. Ryan, how about you? Any key takeaways, forecasting for the coming year? Anything you'd like to share with us as we wrap up? 
Yeah, certainly. Um, well, just, you know, obviously we're getting towards the end of, uh, end of the year here and, you know, most of the deals that, that aren't, uh, you know, in process or haven't begun the process, you know, probably are going to spill over with the holidays approaching into next year and just talking to the number of our capital sources, everyone's going to have either equal or larger allocations of capital for next year. Um, that goes across the board from banks to life insurance companies and, you know, the debt funds that we're dealing with. Um, so, you know, I think that everyone's going to continue to be, you know, bullish on lending and, you know, with where interest rates are today, it's, you know, going to be a, certainly, a, you know, a similar beginning to next year. And unless there's some, you know, economic catastrophe that strikes us, which everyone's, you know, probably a little bit um, weary of, um, I think that we've been on a pretty good run across the board in real estate. And, you know, we thought there would be some COVID interruptions, but that's, you know, continued to just power through. So. Um, you know, I think everyone expects it to be a, a great environment to continue to borrow. And, you know, unfortunately for, for David, who's buying this stuff, it's going to further push down cap rates. I think that's, um, you know, part of the factor in, in this cap rate compression is not only just lack of inventory, but it's just because of where, where interest rates are today. Um, when you're able to bor borrow at a mortgage constant that's, that's so tight or get full-term interest only on lower leverage deal deals because of ample equity in the market, um, you know, it just it allows for borrowers to, to hit their cash on cash metrics on these returns and, and just drives down the cap rate. So, um, you know, we anticipate a, another good start to, to next year. And, and from a capital markets perspective, there's there's plenty of liquidity. So. Thank you, Ryan. That's excellent. So I wanted to pick up a question that we had in the chat. Um, and this is from Ellen Keller, and she asked, in the office to lab conversions, who is paying for these upgrades? Is it the landlords? Is it the tenants? Is there a split? Um, and is it expected that the TI will be amortized over the term or added to the rent? And also, do the tenants expect to move in ready lab space, or will it be converted on spec? A lot of questions <laughs> all at once. But I think, uh, so what we've been seeing in the lab market is increasing TIs, you know, across the board. So I think the, the watermark now is above $200 a square foot for TIs. Um, and we are seeing some tenants paying in addition to that because construction costs are so expensive and lab build outs are very complicated and, you know, require very specific infrastructure and me mechanicals and all of that. Um, I think in terms of like base building upgrades and infrastructure upgrades to get some of these office buildings, you know, adding the mechanicals, making sure they have chemical storage, that I think is coming from the landlords or the developers. And what we see with life science tenants is when they're growing, they need to move now. They can't wait 12 months, 24 months, however long. So we're seeing a lot of these projects moving forward um, to show the market that tenants can, can get in very quickly and get in in their, in their timeline. So I hope that answers most of those questions. Does anyone have anything you want to add to that? You know, who, who's paying for this, right? And how to make the timeline work? Uh, just looking at a couple of, uh, you know, transactions we've looked in this conversion space, I mean, uh, from a spec basis, obviously ahead of, you know, just because of the, the time frame that these tenants are looking to get into the occupancy, um, you know, if someone identifies an asset that's in, you know, a, a market like Burlington, for example, that's seen a lot of this conversion space or a lot of the, you know, kind of towards 495 Beltway. Um, we're seeing a lot more of this happen just because of the costs and the, the supply constraints and land constraints within like the Cambridges, for example. Um, so the developers sometimes want to get ahead of it. They'll begin spending that TI money on the other side. But, you know, from an investor's perspective, they're solving back for the same return thresholds that they were looking to do, whether the, you know, whether it's um, identified and paid up front by a tenant, if you have a tenant in tow and a lease kind of negotiated on a site, or if you're doing it on a spec basis. But I think that Again, if the if it's a you know a conversion project that's done ahead of time, and um, uh, I think that the you know developers want to want to just get ahead of it, but it's all going to come back in and be paid one way or another, either in the rent or in the um, 
TIs that, that are provided and, you know, it, it probably gets amortized at something like a seven or 8% return across the 10 year term of the lease. So. Excellent. Thank you, Ryan. That's terrific. So I believe that Rocco and Rick can open up the room. So if any of one, uh, our audience members wanted to pose a question directly to our panelists, are we able to do that, Rick? Yeah, you're welcome to do anything you like. Such power here. So so if anyone has any questions you'd like to pose to our panelists, please unmute yourself. But and before, before we go to anyone, I, I have a question. Uh, because, you know, I, I, I talk to a lot of construction companies and, you know, right now we have a, not just an issue with materials, but we have an issue with skilled labor. And when we're talking about uh, spec buildings and uh, new construction, would it be wiser for someone that would be interested in industrial or even office, uh, go after older facilities or uh, you know, uh, existing properties instead of uh, building new property, a new building or a new uh, a spec property to sell. So uh, I'll take a crack at that. Um, it's a nuanced answer, right? So to touch on your first point, go and buying an older asset. Um, I've done that. I, I did that at my previous life at, at uh, my previous employer. And the capital costs associated with upkeeping a 1975 vintage building, albeit shorter, uh, cheaper to buy, it adds up. It adds up. And when you go to sell it, your cost basis, because you have to re replace the roof and the parking lot's always an issue, or your, your HVAC systems need replacement. These things add up and you don't necessarily get paid for it in older buildings. Um, the second part of your question, wouldn't it just be easier to buy a building that's already completed? Uh, yes. And that you get paid for that. So I'm sorry, you pay for it. So to go buy a long-term net leased asset to Amazon right now in Boston, you're going to be in a three and a half to probably three, six point, uh, three, three point six percent unlevered return. So your, 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 your day one return is 3.6%. To go buy a spec building, that you're going to take either on vacant shell or you're going to do a forward commit with the with the developer, you get, I don't know, Ryan might agree with me, probably between 75 and 100 basis points of spread on, on an unlevered yield. So you get paid for taking on the risk, but it's because it's harder. You have development risk. You have, let's say the market takes a turn and the leasing velocity goes down. Now you're stuck with a vacant shell that you're paying operating expenses on. So you get you get paid for taking that additional risk, although that spread is coming in. No, I would 100% agree with that. And we have clients that are doing that and same thing, they flipped out and, you know, I'd say the developers were happy at the time. And, and once the lease was executed with some of these big tenants on the back end after selling it on a spec basis, uh, they were a little disappointed, but, uh, you know, I think it's a win-win for everyone. And um, to touch on the older supply, it's, you know, um, you know, new buildings are state of the art, um, not only with energy efficiency, but, you know, a lot of, you um, you know, some of the older assets weren't built to accommodate some of these cross dock, um, either air quality, you know, higher bay. I think that, you know, because we're so land constrained in here, there's not a lot of added costs once you get into the numbers to go from, you know, from that 26 foot, 27, 28 foot, all the way up to 36 feet. And, um, you know, able to stack inventory, you know, higher in these buildings, you know, you can almost start breaking it down. And I'm sure it's a metric that Liz is going to start paying attention to, but the, the cubic foot um, is, is truly a metric that I think is, is critically important in industrial space and warehouse space. And, um, the automation of some of these facilities, you walk through these, you know, Amazon Walgreen buildings and, you know, they're not, they're, they're not worried about, um, you know, injuries in the workspace because half of what they're doing is automated anyway. And it's, you know, it's just moving through these facilities and ability to put, put, you know, product all the way up, um, as high as, you know, 38, 40 feet, I think is, is going to be materially important, especially when you're, dealing with smaller and smaller parcels as, as these, as this land um, continues to be constrained. So. Rick, I want to add that you talked about labor shortage. There's a real quick, um, there's a very large developer, nationwide developer in here in the Philadelphia area. They were going into different uh, depressed neighborhoods to try to do development projects. And instead of dislodging the, the people that were there, they go in and they hold 
job fairs and they send those people to technical college. And then when the vendors come back to that are selected to build property, they're required to hire X number of those people that they've sent that they've trained and they train they trained them on their cost. And so what they've done is they've increased the community. The community now embraces the project and they've got people that live in the community that now get jobs that, that are trained and get jobs on the project. Um, I, I was on a panel like this and I heard the story and I, it's about six months ago and I was just like, I was completely taken back by, by the, you know, the community involvement. So it's one way, you know, one way that people are making a difference in, in taking on the community as well as uh, creating a skilled labor in the same, uh, skilled labor at the same time. And, well, I think we see more and more of that happening. And, you know, I, I, I brought up the point only because, you know, I've seen projects like uh, La Poli Company in Lawrence, where they have over a million square feet of these old mill buildings that they converted into office and some industrial, uh, which has been a very successful project, but they got the community behind it and they got a lot of extra funding, grant money and things of that nature to put that project together seen it in Pawtucket, Rhode Island as well, in Central Falls, Rhode Island, yep. where they have a lot of those type of buildings and in Lake Manchester, New Hampshire as well. So that's why I bring up the topic uh, of, is it better to take a building like that and try to get as much of the this extra funding that's available out there. And you can even push for more funding, you know, because if they want you bad enough to get that eyesore uh, fixed up, yep. you know, they, they're going to look for that extra TIF money or uh, put together some nice packages for you to improve the area. But like David said, it's a heck of a lot more work, but it, you know, it's, it's fulfilling. Yeah, I just figured with the cost of goods, you know, materials, it, uh, it could make, you know, the extra time and that uh, extra effort might be worth the while. I don't know. You, you are the experts, not me. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, there was a ton of information, a lot of great information. I really enjoyed the panel. Uh, I, I think we, uh, we can go on for another hour with these, some of these topics. But if you are interested in joining us for a few minutes afterwards, you know, you're welcome to. We're going to do a little network little networking that uh, we hope everyone that uh, has joined in will continue. Uh, so if you want to stay on with us for a few more minutes, uh, we can start some, uh, some of our networking. And we're just going to switch everyone over. And while we're doing that, I just want to put up our, our PowerPoint that uh, we use for the for this event. While you're doing that, Rick, I just want to say thank you so very, very much to David, to Liz, to Ryan and Daly for sharing your expertise with us today. It's an incredibly invigorating conversation and I do wish we had more time, but thank you very much for sharing your expertise with us. I want to thank our sponsors again, uh, Northmark, U.S. Pavement Services, Inspired Technology, and Evolu Evolution Energy Partners. And I also like to thank our panel for joining us this morning and anyone that has attended. I want to thank you all. I know everyone's busy and trying to make the best of their day and take the time out to join us is, is really, uh, we really appreciate that.